Hi, thanks for coming to this talk, which is on uh, oh, this, talk. this is on uh, the functions of joint attention. So the outline of the talk is this. First, I'll just say a little bit about what I understand joint attention to be, at least in an intuitive sense, and then to say something about the kind of roles which joint attention plays in our lives. Then, I, number two, I'm going to focus on uh, a particular role which joint attention has, which is a role within joint action. Uh, then I'm going to argue against two standard views of understanding the role of joint attention within joint action. One standard view is inactivism. Another standard view is cognitivism. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about relationalism and what I'll argue for is a version of relationalism which I call rich relationalism, relationalism which can be contrasted with lean relationalism. Uh, so that's that's the general outline. Uh, so I'm going to talk just firstly then about what joint attention is and uh, the roles which it plays in our lives. So this is how I'm understanding uh, joint attention. This is just an intuitive way of uh, presenting it. So you can uh, imagine a situation in which there's two or more agents attending to an object in the presence of each other, where the fact that they are each so attending is public or open in some robust sense between the participants. So it's open as opposed to one in which each person is just attending for themselves and they're oblivious or unaware of the other person. So here are some quotidian examples from the literature. Christopher Peacock has an example of two parents watching a child take their first steps. They're both sitting there and it's transparent between them what's happening. Uh, a second example comes from uh, Jane Heal. So uh, Jane Heal has an example of a waiter in a restaurant, a clumsy waiter, and coming towards the table and then the waiter drops the plates and the two people who are sitting at the table are jointly aware of what's happened. And she contrasts that with the situation in which one of the participants drops uh, their food in their lap accidentally and is unsure whether the other person has seen. And the other person has seen, but in that circumstance, it's not open. There's uncertainty about what each other knows. In the first situation where the waiter drops the plates, then it's completely open, it's completely transparent. And then there's a, a third example which comes from John Campbell. John Campbell kind of contrasts one situation in which you're playing a game, but you're each hidden within kind of booths and playing it on a television screen and wondering whether the other person has seen the target or not. And he contrasts that, and that's not open. And then contrasts that with a case in which you're both kind of outside of the booths, outside in the real world, and there's a target there. And then it's completely transparent and open between the two of you um, that the target is there. That's a version of coordinated attack. Uh, and it's a kind of example which I'll be using in a moment. OK, and I'll just quickly say something about the roles of joint attention within our lives. My focus is going to be on C. That is, it's going to be on the, uh, uh, the role of joint attention within joint actions, within shared plans. Uh, but joint attention has various other roles. It has a role within social development. Uh, and it also has a role within communication and reference. Uh, Axel Siemens uh, just uh, uh, written a really good book on this uh, called The Shared World. But I'm going to be focused on joint action. OK, so I'm going to be talking about the role of joint attention within joint action. And the kind of joint actions which I'm talking about are, for example, something like within this picture where two agents are cooking a meal together where there is a shared plan and a shared intention and the various different steps which might be shared out or in some sense collaboratively done between two participants. So although joint attention can occur in a bottom-up way, and that's the way in which it's often thought of, I mean, Jane Hill's example of someone dropping a plate and then that becoming joint attention, that's a kind of bottom-up one. One of its main roles is actually top-down. So you think about it, joint attention as being something which is embedded within joint activities. So, for example, cooking a meal together, pass the salt, pass the milk, etc. So that, that's something where you're attending to the ongoing process together. And my focus will be on these types of highly interactive cases. 
where the action in question is cooperatively loaded, um, where the agents are cooking together. That is, they are together involved in the action rather than maybe doing so side by side, one person cooking one meal, another person cooking another meal. When we say that people study together, we mean it in that non-cooperatively loaded way. They might be sitting side by side. But if they're cooking together, at least in the examples which I'm thinking of, there's a lot of crossover in terms of their uh, sub plans and their sub intentions. There's a mesh, as Michael Bradman puts it. So the particular example of uh, joint action which I want to focus on is the example of uh, what I call the hunt. So in this example, you can imagine that we're uh, both um, uh, Neolithic hunters and uh, we have to get uh, a stag uh, to eat and we go out on the hunt and uh, what we need to do is we need to attack in unison. If we don't attack in unison, then we won't get the stag. In fact, if one of us attacks and the other person doesn't, then the stag's going to run away and so are all the other animals in the area. So effectively, we've got two options. We either attack in unison and then we get the best outcome, which is the stag, or we decide not to attack. We each go off and look for rabbits. OK, that's not quite as good as getting the stag, but at least we won't starve. The very worst thing is one of us attacks and the other person doesn't, and then we don't get the stag. Now, it strikes me as fairly obvious, I think, that, that joint attention is going to have some kind of role to play in these kind of circumstances. And the kind of role which it's going to have to play is kind of multifarious. Um, so it's going to have a role, firstly, of allowing the agents to identify the object in front of them, at least to be able to see that the, 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 the stag is there. That is, it's going to give them a, a kind of awareness of its spatio-temporal location. Secondly, it's going to allow them to be aware that they're each aware of that stag spatio-temporal location. And thirdly, it's going to allow them to understand that the object they see before them is a stag. It's only via seeing it that they can actually see that that thing is a stag. OK, so those are the, the kind of roles which I think joint attention has to play, and I'll go over that now in more detail. OK, so joint attention, I think, has the uh, has this following three part function. So there are three parts to this function of joint attention. The first part is the referential function. So this provides awareness of the object. So joint attention provides the agents with awareness of the object, in particular, its spatio temporal location, where and when. They need to act if they are to coordinate. It gives them an awareness of the spatio-temporal location of the objects in front of them. Secondly, joint attention provides the agents with transparency, the transparency function. It provides transparent joint awareness of each other's attention to the object, and so provides them with a reason to coordinate with respect to that object. And then thirdly, it has a conceptual function. That is, it links one's plans, one's prior plans, one's shared prior plans, to the situation in front of them. So it provides joint awareness of a token object of a general type, where acting upon a, concept, a, a token of that conceptual type executes an element of a commonly known prior shared intention. Putting these together, I would say there's a tripartite function to joint attention. The joint attention functions to provide agents with a reason to coordinate at a particular spatio-temporal location with respect to a particular object by way of a transparent joint awareness of that object and where coordinating with respect to that ob object would successfully execute a commonly known prior shared intention. So that's that's the claim is that there's these three parts to joint attention. One is outward looking. The other is uh, that, it, that it allows for transparency between the agents. And the third is it allows contact with 
the conceptual life of the agents. For example, it allows contact with their shared plan. And the joint attention is, is kind of the, the interface by which these things can be joined together. OK, so supposing that that's true, so supposing that's true, that, that there's something to be said for the idea that that's the role which joint attention has to play within joint actions. How now should we understand joint attention? Well, I said at the start, there's various different theories. There are kind of uh, lean and rich theories. Uh, um, I just want to quickly say something about what the problems I think there are with cognitivism, particularly with rich cognitivism. I think that fails to satisfy the transparency function. That is, it fails to give an account of how the information might be transparent between two individuals. Uh, and that's because cognitivism relies on, an in, on various individualistic assumptions, which mean that there is never that full transparency. Um, and I think that there's a problem with an activism because I think that fails to satisfy the referential function because actions themselves do not exhibit an articulate referential structure unless they're supplemented with either representations or some kind of direct perception. But then that's to shift into another point of view. That's to shift into cognitivism or relationalism. So that's I know that's very, very quick. There's much more to be said about that. But that's, broadly speaking, why I think they these two positions are problematic. Um, and what I think is less problematic is relationalism. Now, relationalism, just broadly speaking, is a position within the philosophy of perception, where uh, perceptual experience is understood as involving not internal representations, not the sense data, but rather perception is understood as a relation between a subject and the world which they experience. So their conscious experience is determined by the layout of the world, which figures within their conscious experience. So it's a relation between the agent and, for example, just the object here, a green tree in that picture. So here's a quote from Campbell. He says, the phenomenal character of your experience, according to relationalism, as you look around the room, is constituted by the actual layout of the room itself. Which particular objects are there, their intrinsic properties, such as colour and shape, and how they're arranged in relation to each other. OK, so what does this say about joint attention? Well, what it says about joint attention is that within joint attention, the claim is that what was a di dyadic relation in, gen in, in standard perception, that is a relation between subject and object, in joint attention, it becomes a triadic relation. So it's not just one subject there, there's two. And these two subjects are co-subjects in some so there's a three place experiential relation, a joint attentional triangle, as Campbell calls it, between person A, person B and an object C. And that person A and person B enter into, in some sense, each other's experience, not as another object, but rather they enter into each other, into each other's experience as co-subjects. They enter into each other's experience in some kind of special manner. OK, so how should we understand relationalism? Well, the way which Campbell understands it is in a lean way. So for him, when two subjects co-attend to an object, the way in which each of the agents is experiencing, each of the subjects is experiencing the object, does not matter to the individuation of the shared experience. So the way in which each of the agents is experiencing the object is not part of the shared experience. Whereas rich relationalism, which is the position which I'm going to try and argue for here, says that when two subjects co-attend to an object, the way in which each of the agents is experiencing the object does matter to the individuation of the shared experience. It's part of the shared experience, the way in which each is attending to the object. So just to say, here's Campbell's lean relationalism, a quote from Campbell. He says, the three place relation of joint attention is extensional. It doesn't exhibit any sensitivity to the ways in which X and Y are thinking of Z. If you're jointly attending with me, then there is, of course, some particular way in which you're counting your target, some particular perspective you have it, 
have on it. However, standing in this three-place experiential relation with me does not in itself convey to you anything about the way I am encountering the object and vice versa. And I think this is problematic because relationalism, I think, has the advantage of being able to deal with the referential and transparency functions, which I mentioned earlier. But if you take this lean approach, I think it has problems with the conceptual function, which I mentioned. That is, it has trouble then relating joint attention to our shared plans. So if the way that each of the uh, agencies experiencing in the stack does not enter into their shared experience, then the agents are not able to determine that they're each attending to the stag, qua stag. That is, we don't have the labels there in our joint attention. It doesn't become labelled as a stag. And so then I'm not justified in attacking that object because I don't know whether you know it's a stag or not. You might think it's something else. You, you're certainly attending to it and it might be transparent between us that you're attending to it. But what's not transparent on this lean approach is what that thing is and that seems essential to our being able to jointly act on it that we know what that thing is so that's what rich relationalism would get you i think rich relationalism says that the shared experience is individuated not merely by the fact the agents are jointly attending to the same object but they're transparently jointly attending to the same object in the same way this is necessary to fulfill that conceptual function, that third function. Um, so you can see the contrast here. The rich one says A and B are jointly attending to C in this intentional way. So C is understood in an intentional way. It's captured within the agent's joint experience. Whereas Campbell's lean approach has the, um, the object outside the scope of their joint attention, so to speak, or at least the conceptualization of the object is out the outside of the scope of their joint attention. Um, so that's extension. <laughs> that's, that's clear. OK, so what allows us to say that the agents are jointly attending to this stag in this rich intentional way is twofold. OK, so 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 there's something about the rich relation is approach, which someone might think, oh, there's something uh, not quite in the spirit of relationalism uh, with it. But I, I, I think there is something in the spirit of relationalism, because what you could argue is you could argue that uh, along the following lines, that the stag looks thinly, extensionally, like a stag, i.e. in terms of its extension, it has all of the properties which along some kind of dimension allow it to be objectively classified as being stag-like. It has enough of the appropriate properties. So that's just an extensional thing. It thinly looks like a stag. But what gives it a kind of thick conceptual aspect, what makes it rich, is this second point, that the stag looks thickly like a stag to the participants, i.e. they jointly see it as a stag because, well, firstly, because it looks thinly like a stag. And then secondly, they have this background, this background of certainly common ground culturally and linguistically, but also they have common knowledge of their shared plan. That's part of their common ground. That's part of their common knowledge, that they have a shared plan to catch a stag. So they're both there waiting, and they know that they're each waiting for that stag to arise. And so when there's something which is conspicuously stag-like, which appears, then that becomes part of their joint attention, something which they can see as a stag. And then that fulfills the conceptual function. OK, I hope the general gist is clear. Thank you for listening.